Welcome to Lombard Bible Church Online. My name is Justin. I'm the senior pastor at Lombard Bible Church. We're very thankful that you've joined us for our online worship service. Please click on the video link in the description for the connection card. We would love to connect with you, see how we can pray with you, and follow up with you and answer any questions you may have about church or about Jesus. Connection card isn't just if you're new either. Uh, we would love to pray and connect with anyone. Uh, if anyone needs prayer for a pastor, if anyone has needs during this difficult COVID crisis, we'd love to come alongside you. Just a couple announcements uh, this morning. One, tonight, Sunday, May 31st at 6 p.m., we're having our annual ministry meeting. It will not be done in person. It'll be done virtually. But we do need everyone to be a part of it. Even if you don't have a computer, you can still dial into the meeting. Uh, so please look in uh, the description on our website how you can uh, be part of this May ministry meeting. Uh, anyone can be a part of it. Uh, just members can vote. Additionally, Lumbar Bible Church is progressing uh, towards its in-person uh, programs and reopening. Uh, right now, uh, we are encouraging people to meet in groups of 10 or less if you are not at risk and you are able to maintain six foot distance as well as wear face masks at all times. Please do meet together. You can even gather together to, uh, for a life group uh, perhaps or to, or to watch the worship service together online. We do encourage you to start meeting together more. Uh, please uh, pray for and with the governing board as well as we slowly go throughout this process of what it looks like and when it looks like for our church to gather together more and more in person. And right now, if you would just join me in prayer for this worship service overall. Father God, we thank you so much that we can come together even online or over the phone to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that we are not bound as a church by a building, but we are bound by the love and the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is in all and fills all and moves through us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. And dying in our place and giving us new life, we thank you for the incredible ways we see you working in our community and around the world for the healing you have brought, for the peace that you bring in the midst of such trying circumstances. We thank you for the love of Christ that is being seen in incredible ways. And Father, our hearts are also breaking for the people that are suffering right now, whether from, from COVID-19 or racial injustice. God, we know there is a lot of suffering and anxiety and a lack of peace right now. And we pray, Lord, for your peace upon people, for your unity, for your justice, for what is right to be done. We pray you would give us wisdom as we look faithfully into what it looks like to follow you with all of our hearts. We pray for this worship service, Lord, that we would open our, ourselves up to you, that we would be listening to what you have to speak to us through your word. We pray that this would also be a time for us to offer ourselves to you, to lay our baggage, our anxieties at the feet of Jesus and give you praise and give you glory through, through music, through prayers, through scriptures. We pray, Lord, that we would lift up the name of Jesus together this morning and that you would fill our hearts with your love and with your truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join me in a liturgy based on Psalms 139. I'll say the leader portion. Please join me in saying out loud the response from your homes. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Before word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If you go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I'll rise on the wings of the dawn. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Almighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be losing Were not the right man the 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time to co come together as a church, to spend time away from the world, to spend time in fellowship and sitting under your word. We thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you for Justin and the time and effort he's put together to do the sermon today. We pray for your blessing on him and his message. We pray, Lord, um, that you will reveal to us what you want us to learn in Jonah today. And we remember your, that just like Jonah, sometimes we 
see your sovereignty, especially in the storms that come our way. And there are many in storms today, Lord. And we, want, we pray that you would bless them and, and give them peace, that you are in the boat with them today. And that you would speak peace into their lives. We pray, Lord, for um, our dear brother, Don Jones, and ask, lift him up to you, that he would be um, continue to heal, and he would be um, knowing your peace and comfort, that you would bless his family as they care for him. He is so precious to us, Lord. And we also pray for our many family, friends that are recovering and still suffering from the COVID-19, and we lift them up to you as well, Lord. We would pray for their healing and full restoration. But we also pray, Lord, that amidst this time of chaos and confusion with COVID, that you would instruct our hearts as what you would want us to learn and to see in this time. Because we know you are, behind, you are um, in control of all things. And we also lift up um, this dear little boy, PJ, who has been in a um, motor uh, accident. Um, who is suffering in a coma and oh Lord what a what a hard thing for a small child to be um, that sick and we pray for that him and we pray for his family and we pray that you will give them strength and peace during this time and that you would be with PJ even in the midst of this coma and Lord we also come to you with gratitude gratitude for what you have given us even amidst a time where there's so many things missing, we have much to give you thanks for. We thank you for uh, the way you have provided for us each and every day, and we pray for your blessing on the offering today at church, and that we would be ever mindful of our um, responsibility as, as a family in this church to um, give back to you. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together like the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You call me out upon the waters, the great find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul
Today we're going to be talking about the book of Jonah. Um, Clive, have you heard of the book of Jonah before? Um, I have. Uh, what are some things you can tell us about the story? Well, Jonah believed in God, and then God told him to go to a place called Nineveh to teach people who didn't believe in God to believe. But then he ran away into a ship and ran away from God too. So God sent a storm. And then the people knew that Jonah was the one who was causing the storm because of his sin. So they threw him off the boat and a giant fish ended up swallowing him. And then three days later he got out and went to Nineveh to preach to um, the people. And this time he obeyed because he didn't want to sin again. Hmm. Amen. <laughs> it's a pretty good summary, right? Um, but the book of Jonah shows us how much God wants to fix our relationship with him. Um, he wants us all to have a chance to repent. But what does it mean to repent? It means to kind of turn away from your sins and going to God, kind of like changing your beliefs. Yeah, repentance is admitting that you're wrong um, and changing direction. So Jonah was called to go and tell the people of Nineveh to repent because they were doing evil things. But did he? No. No, well, at least not at first, right? He ran away. Um, Jonah's disobedience, actually, to God's command, showed his own sin, um, his own mistakes. Even though Jonah was someone who believed and followed God, he still struggled with sin, just like you and I do. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't listen, and he didn't obey. And although he looked better than the people of Nineveh, because he wasn't doing the same bad things, God knew that his heart needed to change, just like theirs did. So pay attention as the story unfolds to see how God calls both Jonah and the people of Nineveh to repent and to believe. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what 
people are you? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of this fish for three days and for three nights. I've had more than a few people ask me this past week, when is the church going to reopen? And I thought to myself, wait, the church is closed? What have I seen been going on these past three months where I've seen uh, people coming together online to do communion and worship together, where I've seen shut-ins be ministered to by phone calls and letters and gifts, where I've seen the, the needy and the marginalized be, be served and loved by people from this church, uh, where we've seen the gospel proclaimed to new people in our community and around the world. When is the church going to reopen? When wasn't it open? Lombard Bible Church has been open because the church is not a building. The church is a people. Now, I get the question, though. When is the church going to reopen? Certainly, the person was trying to get at when is the building that Lombard Bible Church uses going to reopen? When is the in-person programs and the in-person gatherings going to continue? And that is a great question. And one, as a church, we are prayerfully and carefully looking into uh, as time goes on. And at this time, as Illinois has moved into the next phase of reopening, so too is Lombard Bible Church. At this time, we encourage you, if you're not at risk, to meet in person in groups of 10 or less, whether it's for Sunday school or a life group or even a uh, Sunday worship online watch party. Gather together with, in groups of 10 or less as long as you can maintain six foot distance uh, for social distance as well as wear a mask. We encourage you to do that. Now this is a constantly evolving situation. We encourage you to, to pray with us and to pray for us as we continually seek wisdom. Wisdom that comes from God. Wisdom that, as James 3 talks about, wisdom that is first of all pure and wisdom that is peace-loving and considerate and submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Now, at the same time, as we carefully seek this wisdom that comes from God, let's be encouraged. When it comes to the question, when is the church going to fully reopen? Let's remind ourselves the church has been open this whole time because the church is not a place. The church is not a building. The church is a people who are called by God and are doing what God has called them to do. And that's what we've seen in Lombard Bible Church these past few months. And that has not stopped. You know, in our scripture today, there's one man named Jonah who forgot about that. Jonah, he called himself a worshiper of the Lord, Jonah 1.9, and yet Jonah didn't do what God called him to do. He forgot what the church was supposed to be. So if you join this, me this morning, let's go into the scripture in Jonah chapter 1. Open your Bibles to Jonah 1. If you don't have a Bible, no problem. Just Google Jonah 1 NIV. That's where we're going to camp in this morning. As you look up Jonah chapter 1, let's get a little background. Who is this Jonah? Jonah is an 8th century BC Middle Eastern Jewish man. He grew up in Galilee in a town called Gath 
Hefer. That kind of neat fact, it's just a couple miles from Nazareth where Jesus himself grew up. In Jonah's day, Israel, that's God's people, uh, was a small but a strong empire expanding its borders. Uh, Assyria was Israel's enemy. Assyria, they had a large city. In fact, its largest city was Nineveh. Uh, it was three days just to walk through the city, 120,000 people. That's like three Lombards worth of people with a lot more land. Uh, and that's Assyria's largest city, Nineveh. Now, Assyria, Israel's enemy, was a cruel nation. They were known for even flaying their enemies alive. In fact, 30 years after Jonah, Israel itself would be destroyed by Assyria, and they'd be exiled from their land, 722 B.C. Back to Jonah. Jonah himself, he's a prophet of God. A prophet is someone who's given a message from God. You know someone is a prophet in Scripture because it says the word of the Lord came to Abraham, or the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, or in this case, in Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, before the book of Jonah, Jonah's already done the prophet thing before. We, we've seen Jonah in 2 Kings 14, where we learned that God used Jonah to give a message from God to the evil king, Jeroboam too. but that's the king of Israel. And so in the past, we see last time God told Jonah to speak a message of hope for God's people through an evil king. This time... God tells Jonah to speak a message for the evil enemies of God's people, the Ninevites in Assyria. How will Jonah react? Let's, let's find out in the scripture, Jonah chapter 1, if you would just join me in prayer before we get started. Come, Holy Spirit. Father God, may the Spirit of Jesus lead us to what is true this morning and point us to you. Father God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word that is living and active. Help us to be hearers of what you have to say to us this morning. In your name, amen. Let's look at Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So God is telling Jonah, preach against Nineveh. Its wickedness has come up before me. This is familiar Hebrew language. It reminds us of Genesis 6, the flood story, in which we read in Genesis 6, 13, God said to Noah, look, the end of all flesh has come up before me. Same language, for the earth is filled with violence. And this is what is going on in Nineveh. Nineveh is a wicked city full of violence. We see that in Jonah 3.8. They're going to be destroyed because of their wickedness and violence. And so when we, when we read this, this prophecy, this message that God has for Jonah to give, we're made to think, man, God is just as angry as Nineveh and Assyria because of their wickedness and violence as when he destroyed the world with a flood because of their wickedness and violence in Genesis 6. This is bad stuff going on. God is angry. And, and, and for Jonah, it should make sense. These are God's, this is the enemy of God's people, Assyria. Of course, God would be angry with them. Every scene, everything seems to make sense. Now, all Jonah has to do is relay this message, just like any good prophet would do. So let's see what happens in verse 3. Uh, so Jonah, he ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. That's not what prophets are supposed to do. They're supposed to give the message. So, I mean, Jonah was supposed to preach against Nineveh. That's what he was supposed to do. Instead, look at verse 3. It says, but Jonah, he ran from the Lord. He headed for Tarshish. When he, man, when Jonah ran away, he ran away far. Tarshish is thousands of miles away from Israel. 
it's really far away. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 9, we read that King Solomon... When he was king of Israel, he had trading ships for Tarshish, and that they would go back and forth between Tarshish every few years, and it was so far away that they would come back with such exotic items like gold and silver and apes and peacocks. I mean, Jonah must, he, he must have gone to Port Joppa and just been like, where is the farthest any one of you ships are going? Tarshish, I'm there. And he went on that boat. But here's the question, why did Jonah run? Why would Jonah run away? He's a prophet of God, he's done this before. Now, instead of preaching for God's people, he's supposed to preach against Nineveh, God's, the enemies of God's people. Why is Jonah running away? I mean, was, was he afraid of the Assyrians, of the Ninevites? I mean, after all, they are known for flaying their enemies of li uh, alive. Was Jonah afraid for his own life? Why did Jonah run away? Was he, was he worried about how difficult the task was? I mean, 120,000 people, three days just to walk through the city, that's, that's an exhausting job. Was he overwhelmed by the amount of work he would have to do as a prophet in this case? Why did he run away? You know what? If we look in the scripture, we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet. We, we eventually find out in chapter 4 in like a M. Night Shyamalan plot twist. But for now, suffice it to say, we don't know why Jonah ran away. We just know that he did. But the next obvious questions on our minds then is, all right, we don't find out why Jonah ran away yet. But what does it mean that Jonah ran away from the Lord? I mean, the text doesn't say Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish. It says he ran away from the Lord. How is that even possible? How do you run away from the Lord? Even in our liturgy this morning, in Psalm 139, we read, Lord, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from you? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. How can Jonah run away from the Lord, as the scripture says. Well, if we look closely at the scripture, we get a clue that explains what it means that Jonah ran away from the Lord. If you look at a more literal translation, it reads, Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now that's a phrase we've heard before. It harkens back to Genesis 3, 8, when Adam and Eve, they were told by God one thing, you can, you can eat anything in the garden, just, just don't eat from the tree of good and evil. Well, they disobey, they eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in Genesis 3, 8, we read that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And what did they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. See, Adam and Eve, just like Jonah, God had told them to do something and they, they didn't do it. Both Adam and Jonah were casting themselves off from the presence of the Lord. But again, what does it mean to run from God's presence if God is everywhere? Well, there's one final clue. The word presence can also mean face or favor. So you could also translate it as Jonah ran away from the face of the Lord. Or Jonah ran away from the favor of the Lord. It's the same word that's used in number six that we often close our worship services with. The benediction, the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his, may his face, his presence, his favor shine down on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face, his, his presence, his favor towards you and give you peace. What does it mean to run, to flee from the presence of the Lord? It's to flee from the favor of God because you know what you ought to do, but you don't do it. And that was Jonah. He knew what he was supposed to do. He was called by God to preach against the Ninevites, but he didn't do it. How many of us do the same thing? 
How many of us flee from the presence of the Lord, just like Jonah did, when we know what God wants us to do, but we don't do it. James 4, 17 says this, sin is this, when you know what you ought to do, but you don't do it. That's what Jonah did. See, at first I thought, man, I'm not like Jonah at all, fleeing from the presence of God and a fool on a ship to Tarshish. But with a closer look, I realize I am like Jonah far too often because I flee from the presence of the Lord every time I know what God would have me do. I know what I ought to do, but I don't do it. I flee from the presence of the Lord when I know I should love my neighbor as myself, but I don't. I've just been convicted by this recently, especially like, man, I want to love my neighbor. We, we got to have um, our, our, my neighbor over for dinner. Wait, no, COVID. Uh, but, but something, right? You know, I'm going for groceries. Do you need anything? You know, something. We got to love our neighbors as ourselves. But when we don't, we're fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I, I know I flee from the presence of the Lord when I don't do what I know I ought to do. Like when I, when I judge those outside the church. 1 Corinthians 5.12. I know I flee the presence of the Lord when I neglect to pray for those who persecute me. Matthew 5.44. I know I flee the presence of the Lord when I indulge myself instead of deny myself. Matthew 16.24. I know I flee the presence of the Lord when I consider myself more important than others. Philippians 2.3. Are you fleeing the presence of the Lord right now? Is there something you know you ought to do, but you don't do it? See, here's the problem with, with fleeing the presence of the Lord is because we can, we can run just like Jonah, but we can't hide. Jonah may have fled the presence of the Lord, but he couldn't hide from God and, and God found him on that ship. And the same is true for us. We can flee from the presence, the favor of the Lord, but we can't hide. It reminds me uh, of my college professor. He told me a true story of a woman in one of his adult ed night classes on teaching the Bible. Uh, the woman was married. Her husband was gone all the time traveling for his job. And, and this married woman and another man, they, they got and in the class, they got to talking and talking quite a lot, and soon they kind of developed a relationship, and it got to the point where uh, late one night, the man showed up at this married woman's door when her husband was off at a conference. The only people at the house that night were the married woman and this other man, and she, she welcomed him in her house, and she held his hands, hers, trembling, and as they both stood in the living room. He got close to her when the ceiling light flickered, and it caught her eye. And, and for the woman, she later said that that ceiling light flicker was a message from God. The ceiling light flickered, and she said to the man, I know why you're here, and I know why I let you in. And I can't stop you. I can't, I can't stop myself. But I know this, and I want you to know this too. Whatever we do tonight is not only seen by that ceiling light, but it's seen by the presence of God. And the man, he didn't say anything. And he turned away and left the house. See, no matter how far we run away, even to, to Tarshish, God sees us. We can run from God's presence, but we can't hide. Jonah found that out the hard way. God sees us like the ceiling light above us. He sees what we do. He sees what we don't do. Are you fleeing from the presence of of the Lord today. Ask God to search your heart. Is there something that, like Jonah, you know what you ought to do, but you're not doing it? 
You know, what I think is beautiful about the book of Jonah is it's not about Jonah, it's about God. You know, God's name in the book of Jonah shows up 39 times. Jonah's name, 18 times. See, there's a reason that the name of this sermon series for Lombard Bible Church is called Jonah, God-Sized Grace. Because the book of Jonah isn't about Jonah, it's about God and his grace. And we clearly see that in the rest of the boat story in chapter 1. You you look on in chapter 1 of Jonah, you see an incredible turn of events in verses 4 through 17. Jonah, he's, he's fleeing from God. We read that Jonah, this prophet of the one true God who made the sea and the waves, this Jonah, he lies asleep below deck in the boat during a growing storm. Jonah, he's awoken by a sailor, exasperated. How could you be sleeping at a time like this? The sailors look to be saved from the wrath of God through Jonah. In fact, the sailors believe what is true, that something must be done to Jonah in order to be saved. Look look at that. Look at verse 11. The sailors asked Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm, to be saved? Intrinsically, the sailors know the only way to be saved is through Jonah. Was Jonah doing something? Was something being done to Jonah? Jonah replies, the only way to be saved, the only way to be saved is to sacrifice me. The sailors, they don't accept that. They, they just try to row harder. They try to row the boat harder to shore, but it's no use. The only way to be saved is sacrifice. They not only condemn Jonah to die, but lead Jonah to his death. They plea not to be held accountable for killing an innocent man, and they throw Jonah to his death, and what happens? The sea immediately is calm. Fear of the Lord comes on all the sailors, and they believe, and they, they, they make sacrifices, they vow, and worship God alone. And not only that, but God provides a way, a large fish, a way to deliver Jonah in three days time. Do you hear something unique about this story? Are you able to hear the story behind the story that God is writing through the prophet Jonah? See, I don't think Jonah chapter 1 is about Jonah. I think it's about God and his God-sized grace. I don't think this chapter is about Jonah. I think it points us to Jesus. Because 700 years after Jonah, what we find is there's another prophet of God named Jesus who's asleep in a boat during a growing storm. Do you remember the story? You can find it in Mark chapter 4. Jesus, the prophet and the one true God, who made the sea and the waves, Jesus lies asleep below deck during a growing storm. Jesus is awoken by a sailor, one of his disciples. How could you sleep at a time like this? The disciples look to be saved through Jesus, and guess what? The storm is calmed, and fear of the Lord rests on all the disciples. Not only this, but the disciples also look to be saved through, for their sins, through the Messiah, who will show us miraculous signs. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will give you only one sign, the sign of Jonah. And the only way to be saved, Jesus says, also in Matthew 16, is to sacrifice me. Well, Peter won't have it. That's not acceptable. You sacrifice yourself? No, that's not acceptable. There's got to be another way. But it's no use. The only way to be saved is Jesus to be sacrificed. Jesus is not only condemned to die, but led to his death. Pilate claims, please, not to be held accountable for killing an innocent man. The soldier who killed Jesus looks in awe upon Jesus' sacrifice and fears the Lord. But God provides a way to deliver Jesus on the third day. Do you see the parallels between the, the life and death of Jesus and the story of Jonah chapter 1? It's not an accident. God is 
speaking to us through his word. Jonah 1 is a reminder that the wrath of God is on all of us for our disobedience. And like those sailors in the book of Jonah, we too are going to die without intervention. And there's nothing we can do to be saved. Think of those sailors. They, they called upon their gods, different gods. It couldn't be saved. They tried to row themselves back to shore by their own power, their own strength. Try to be saved. They could not be saved. They were doomed if it were not for the sacrifice of the messenger of the Lord. And the same is true for us. The only way to be saved is through Jesus, who sacrificed himself to die in our place, and we can be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. There's nothing we can do to be saved. No, no amount of rowing our boats, no amount of good works will allow us to be saved, to go to heaven. Nothing we can do, just like those sailors were hopeless by themselves. And there's no other way to be saved. These sailors, they're calling upon their pagan gods and other belief systems, but there was no other way to be saved. The only way to be saved was through God himself. And God provided a way for us to be saved through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, on the cross to die in our place so that we can be saved, so that we can have a relationship with him that changes our lives. It changed the sailors' lives when they were saved. They, they made vows to the Lord, as we see in verse 16. It changed their lives, and Jesus can change our lives too. If we, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that not only did Jesus die, but in three days, sign of Jonah, he was delivered from death we too can be saved. We can have a relationship with God that starts now and lasts forever, that changes us. This is the good news of the gospel displayed 700 years before Jesus in the book of Jonah chapter 1. Incredible. You know, to close, I think of one of our high schoolers at Lombard Bible Church. His name is John Flanagan. He runs cross country. Wasn't able to run cross country that much this year because of COVID-19. But he is a talented runner. In fact, uh, one time John ran three miles in 17 minutes and 30 seconds. That's three miles in 17 minutes and 30 seconds. He's in high school. It's incredible. But what's even more important to John Flanagan than running the race of cross country is running the race of faith. Just like Hebrews 12 talks about running the race of faith, saying, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for us. You see, John Flanagan, he's been running that race of faith as well. He's been fixing his eyes on Jesus ever since he heard a vacation Bible school preacher talk about actually taking the time to make the decision if you really want to believe in Jesus. And at that VBS, John learned there's, there's no half-hearted following. You either run after Jesus or you flee from him. There's no in-between. And so my final question, my final encouragement, my final challenge is this. Are you running after Jesus or are you fleeing from him? There's no in-between. Are you running after Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy of salvation of us set before him endured the cross? Are you running after Jesus, the one who can save you, who sacrificed himself to die in your place so you could be saved, not only so you could go to heaven, but so that you could have your life changed now? Are you running after that Jesus who saves or are you fleeing from Jesus? Are you fleeing from the presence of the Lord? Are you doing what you know you ought not to do? 
Those are the two choices we have set before us. And it's one we need to pray to God carefully for. Which one am I? Am I running after Jesus or am I fleeing from him? Open God to your heart. Ask him to see if there's anything in you that is pointing either way. Because Jesus has come to change our lives this morning. I believe it. And I believe the good news of the gospel that just as God changed the lives of those sailors, he can change us too. Let's pray together. Father God, we, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who sacrificed himself for us. God, we know there's no other way to be saved. And we thank you that you, you made a way through yourself. Father, we, I, I pray for all those who are hurting and suffering right now. All those who are going through incredible difficulties. I pray, Lord, that they would run after you. That in the midst of frustrations, sickness, disease, hatred, God, I pray, Lord, that they would run after you. That they would not flee from your presence. I pray that I would run after you. That I would not flee from your presence, Lord. We thank you for your grace on us. We pray that we would run after it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in you are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are love.
the sea, no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing, no other name. Bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you. May he turn his face towards you and, and give, give you peace. peace.